at some point I was asking myself, what am I exactly doing here in front of all these brilliant people? We believe that using these endolysins, we will change the paradigm of the way we fight bacteria. For the last two years, I have been working to design a catalyst. It's not a theory anymore. This is the real deal. Instead of superficially cutting just the stem of the weed, we're ripping out the whole root. The concept is fantastic. All their ideas have to be in these three minutes. It's just amazing to see 100 winners because every talent that has performed today is a winner already. This is about young scientists. This is about our future in science. The real problem, ladies and gentlemen, is up here in our minds. How about recycling human hair into papers? The essence here is to use waste hair as the raw material for paper production. time the effects of the drugs on the bacteria on the human immune cells and the pathology in the same environment listening to young people presenting concrete pragmatic solutions how to create sustainable food how to save energy how to recycle really gives me a boost for my own work All people you see have a smile in, in, in the face and, and I trust them, they will change the world. And I think each one of them is taking their expertise and truly trying to do something meaningful. An ecosystem of people who are like-minded. I think it's definitely about sharing and networking. The best day in my life. It's a shame that it's just for one or two days. Good afternoon, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen. We are glad to see you here at the Foreign Walls Lab Kazan 2017 at Kazan Federal <laughs> University. Thank you. What is the lab? The Foreign Walls Lab is a challenging, inspiring, and interdisciplinary format for outstanding talents. It offers the opportunity to excellent academics and professionals to present their innovative ideas, research products, and social initiatives. Each participant is asked to present his or her work in only three minutes. All disciplines here are welcome, from agriculture, medicine, economics, engineer, and humanities. A prestigious jury from science and business awards the best participants. The only one winner will receive the prize here, the ticket to Berlin. And uh, he or her will get the opportunity to give his or her talk on the grand stage of the Falling Walls Conference on November 9, 2017 in Berlin in front of 600 guests, among them institutional leaders, decision makers, worldwide audience via live stream. At the conference, the 20 top class scientists from around the world present their breakthrough answering to the question, which are the next walls to fail? And it is great pleasure for me to present you the members of jury here at Kazan uh, Federal University, uh, Falling Walls Lab Kazan. And uh, the head of the jury is our guest, our friend from Germany, Victor Reimann, Aachen University, Germany. <laughs> Mikhail Vorflamiev the head of the strategic unit Eco Oil Kazan Federal University, the head of Association of Young Scientists and Academics Kazan Federal University. Leah Bushkanitz, Professor, Doctor of Science in Philology, Associate Professor, please welcome. Arkady Kuramshin, Associate Professor, PhD in Chemistry. Our guest from the business, Ayrat Mohamedzianov, RT Seam Company, the resident of the Skolkova. 
And of course, we are presenting a time for uh, the opening and the greeting speech. And on behalf of the Kazan Federal University, please, Mikhail Vorflamev, a few words for our guests and our participants. Dear friends, dear colleagues, we are very glad to see you here in Kazan Federal University. For us, it's a great honor to become a part of this community of falling walls. And here in Kazan, we have a lot of good young scientists which are ready to fall these walls. So we're glad to see you. Let's start our communication and our, uh, our part here in Kazan. Thank you, Mikhail. And of course, this event is hardly be possible without support of our partners from Germany, from DAD and from the DWI. With great pleasure, I'm invited here the head of DAD Information Center at Kazan Federal University, Mr. Tila Zinecke. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear participants of this great event, of this contest today, dear members of the jury, a warm welcome from DAD. I think I don't have to explain who DAD is. We are the German academic exchange service. I wish you all the best and uh, good luck. And one of you is going to my beloved Berlin, the capital of Germany. And I just want to give you on the way to your presentation that there are three things, or at least three things, that don't know borders. That's sports, that's love, and that's science. And you are representing with your idea, your inner mind, and I'm really waiting that you share your new ideas. Because it was an idea that 27 or even 28 years ago uh, made that the Berlin Wall has fallen. I think uh, has fallen is not the right word because it uh, has been torn down, most of all by the idea of uh, people in the German Democratic uh, Republic, how the, they wanted to live better and that's the most important. Okay, long words. Uh, thank you very much. I'm glad that you're here at my new alma mater. And Dobro Pajalovac, success vam. Spasiba. Thank you very much, Mr. Tsinke. And uh, with great pleasure, I want to invite here my new friend from the Moscow German House of Science and Innovation, Denis Kroglov. Thank you, Victor. Well, we all do things. We, all, we do it in first time. And first time I present to the huh? um, um, Things we all do first time, you do it also, yeah? And my religion is every day doing first things first time. Uh, dear participants, dear guests, it's a great honor for me to welcome you here in Kazan Federal University. And I, first of all, would like to thank two fascinating organizers <laughs> Zulfiya Zinatulina and Victor Sidorov, you're, you're great people. Bitte schön, bitte schön. We all like to make the balls fall, and you have broken not a few bricks in the wall between uh, getting firmly established young uh, projects and uh, academic community that is waiting for new solutions. We in the Beha, we do the same thing. We like to break these walls. I wish you, Win, a good luck and good presentations, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we are ready to start. And remember that speakers have only three minutes. If the speaker finish earlier than you, jury or the viewers, you can ask him a question, but the answer couldn't exceed the limit of the three minutes. Small 10 minutes break will be after the eighth speaker. So please welcome our first speaker, Ziganshina Kamila, teaching assistant, Institute of Philology and Multicultural Communication, the breaking the wall of classical opera. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, so my first question is what do you think when you hear the words opera or classical opera? So the survey that I actually conducted um, showed in Facebook among young generation people from around the world that it's mostly loud, confusing, incomprehensible, luxurious or luxury. 
So, and if we look at comics or comic strips, what do we usually think? It, they have smaller texts, uh, they're shorter, they have a lot of pictures, and they're very uh, attractive to younger audience, to teenagers mostly, and definitely easy to perceive. And now my question goes, uh, can we combine these two and make something out of it? And my uh, answer will be definitely. It will be classical com uh, opera comic strips, uh, which are really existing phenomena now in European culture. And also there exist opera computer games, interactive books and cartoons. And this is from William Elliott's Symphony Music uh, on uh, Madame Butterfly. Now a little bit about the uh, science uh, around it. So we have two uh, circles. First is culture core, where actually operas do belong. And they, uh, these texts are usually fixed. Uh, they are important, they are classical, uh, and every person actually who is supposed to be educated should know them. Now the second circle uh, represents culture periphery, so-called so popular culture and mass culture here, and uh, definitely comic strips belong here as, uh, as uh, also uh, computer games and cartoons. So what I propose is to take uh, a text, a narrative of opera, a story, and uh, transport this story into the genre of popular culture or mass culture. For example, making these uh, uh, comic strips or making these uh, kind of cartoons on operas and bringing them to younger generation. And uh, I would like to finish with the words of one uh, world famous uh, violent player David Garrett who said that uh, who is going to educate uh, younger audience so uh, it's us who should do it okay thank you for your attention thank you we have 45 seconds <laughs> for one question please the member of the jury you can ask <laughs> one question please somebody from the audience about the classical opera please Mikhail uh, very, uh, my question about impact. Mm -hmm. What impact do you want to get by your study, by your performances? Yeah, I would like to uh, actually use it with young generation, with students, so actually to make them interested. So that starting with comic strip, they will get interested and they will go into to opera to listen and to watch. And then it won't be so for, uh, frightening and so foreign and so boring as is actually even our media presents sometimes. That's what I'm trying to achieve at least. Thank you. Thank you. The time is exceed. Thank you very much, Camilla. And our next speaker is Ilmir Nugmanov, the associate professor, PhD in geoscience, Kazan Federal University. The breaking the wall of e-learning in geosciences. Please welcome. Good afternoon. World Innovation Summit for Education, which is held annually in Doha, Qatar, highlights the latest advances in, edu in education. The top priority topic concerns the problem of boosting inspiration for both students and teachers in the learning process. One way to maintain interest is to use video game in the learning process. So today I'd like to present a project of virtual laboratory, which reflects our vision on learning by playing concept. The first problem concerns adaptation of young people without specialized training, either engineers, mathematicians, and even human science who wants to obtain a master's degree in geology. Secondly, laboratory core analysis is a routine, expensive, and time-consuming process. Not all desires may have access to high-quality equipped labs. The problem gets even bigger when the project requires students to work in a small group under the supervision of qualified person who must take specific safety precautions and have no margin for errors. But perhaps the most important thing about the virtual laboratory is equal opportunity for all interested students, including disabled ones. The concept, the concept of virtual laboratory can be presented in the form of several key ideas. The first one is learning by doing. Uh, using first person uh, video game with story, experiment notes and explanatory text. The next one is concept of free B, B as busy as B. The third one is power of touch. Using haptic device and technologies for, uh, to feel the rock used in the project. Elasticity and plasticity. Compaction and dilatancy are essential for balanced understanding many geological processes. Next one is uh, treasure under your feet. 
Unique collection of experiments conducted with rocks from various depths and places, and even from outer space meteorites. The last one is hidden knowledge. The whole training process can be recorded in agreement with students and then used for sociological and neurophysiological analysis. Early dementia, autism, and outreachful disease, often not revealed with a routine medical test, can be clearly seen during the game. Hope at this point. Hope at this point you've got only one question left. Can we actually realize this project? And the answer is here. We have high quality equipped labs in Kazan Federal University. Since 2016, we perform comp complex geomechanical tests on core samples and have built up a unique collection of rocks. We know how to simulate physical experiments with finite element modeling software. We have experience on creating 3D virtual reality on Unity. We start to develop haptic device on Arduino. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ilmir. And now I want to welcome to the stage Alsu Garaeva, the postgraduate student, Department of Sociology, Kazan Federal University, the breaking the wall of Islamophobia. <clears throat> Hello. In the truest sense of the word, Islamophobia means fear of Muslims. But why are people frightened of them? 70% terrorist attacks with fatalities are committed by people who are associated with Islam. 85% and 5% of media news show Islam as a negative phenomenon. According to our results of content analysis, they put on a par Islam with such terms as war, violence, and so on. Being a Muslim means to observe a lot of religious regulations. For example, wearing headdress. Such indicators are involving dichotomy on us, non-Muslims, and them, Muslims. This dichotomy begins when we are native and good. At the same time, they are strange, foreign, and potentially troubled. So we have three levels of Islamophobia. What do we have as a result of this level's activity? There is an example from our semi-structured interior. In other places, everybody is looking at our girls in headscarves as if they are terrorists, and our faithful people are named as Wahhabi. In this example, such religious regulations as headscarves and officiations became the reason to label Muslims as radical. So, sociologists can study only fears. Islamophobia is the ideology of Muslims' exception from equal civil society. Islamophobia means practices of non-inclusion Muslims in the sphere of in-group and realizing them as members of out-group. What we can do with Islamophobia? It seems that we can do anything with facts. Or can we? We can say that 70% terrorist attacks are committed by Muslims. Or we can draw attention to the fact that over than 90% of Muslims are members of specific brands of Islam. For example, Tatarstan media in 78% of news show Islam as a positive phenomenon. Tatarstan Muslims are associated with celebration of Karban Bayram, festival of Muslim cinema, and so on. Tatarstan creates a, a fertile ground for comfortable life. According to our actual postgraduate research, there are 12 spheres of business for satisfying Muslims' needs. For example, halal cosmetics, education, and medical halal services. Here is an example from our interview. We celebrate Easter and at the same time Karban Bayram. We present them colored eggs and they present us meat. In such a way, Tatarstan Muslims stop being strained. Countries shouldn't create wars between nations and confessions basing on multiculturalism, but instead make their best to break them. The conditions for that would be governmental politics, economical changes, and social cultural efforts. Breaking the wall of Islamophobia means to include Muslims in the sphere of Ingram, to give them a chance to be native and good. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much also. Now I'm welcoming the next participant. Halulian Marcel, research assistant, open lab of gene and cell technologies, Kazan Federal University. The breaking the wall of broken bones. Imagine, at the end of the conference, you go outside for a smoking break. You go hastily downstairs, one first move, and bang! You fall down, and with 80% certainty, you will break some of your 206 bones. Just be in a cast for a couple of weeks, right? Oh no, it is true. 
but recall you are smoking and it is considered as the risk factor your fracture is not going to be united so here I state the problem fractures do not unite sometimes patients with fracture are always partially immobilized it also they are obliged to use crutches or walkers and it also leads to shoulder and wrist pain Prolonged time being attached to crutches can ultimately bring the patient to a wheelchair. It exerts devastating impact on patients, tearing them out of normal social life and drawing them into pain and loneliness. So, in order to address this problem, we turn to tissue engineering. But what tissue engineering is? By its definition, tissue engineering is the use of combination of cells biomaterials, biomolecules, and engineering. One of the modern tissue engineering approaches is bioprinting. Bioprinter basically resembles inkjet printers. You must still be using at your home or office, but instead of inks, it uses bioinks, combination of cells and gel, which provides sufficient support for cells. Bioprinter gives us a possibility to precisely place cells in desired positions, so they form a personalized construct for a particular case. Therefore, we let's stop. We reflected upon this problem and came up with a, with a solution. Our approach is based on taking patients' own cells outside these, their bodies and for cultivation and subjecting them to biomolecules which are thought to improve Cell, cells' capabilities to form bone tissue. Then these cells are loaded into a bioprinter and used as bioinks. They drop down onto a substrate following a specific pattern along with a gel matrix. Then these cells are loaded into a bioreactor for a while so they grow with vascular plexus. And then this tissue engineered construct is transplanted straight at the fracture site of patient. Our approach in the future might be the insurance. Your 206 bones are on their places, healthy and continuous. Break the walls, not bones. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcel. And now I want to present the next speaker, Zaharov Ivan, from the Kazan National Research Technological University. The break in the wall of development of biodegradable packaging based on plant materials. Good day, dear colleagues, uh, members of commission. Uh, humanity will not die atomic bombs and endless wars it will bury itself under mountain of their own ways, so said the Nobel laureate Niels Bohr. Currently, a large part uh, of the waste uh, is a plastic packaging. Four trillion plastic bags uh, is implemented uh, worldwide annually. All traditional plastic is not uh, biodegradable, and the raw materials from which we are made is not renewable. Therefore, uh, it is relevant to develop uh, biodegradable packaging uh, materials based on plant polymers. Excuse me. Uh, I have developed and patented a uh, biodegradable packaging fin based on uh, proteins and polysaccharides. I have uh, developed a national standard of Russian Federation uh, uh, on biodegradable packaging film uh, and uh, which include uh, general uh, technical specifications. Uh, I have uh, received uh, commercial proposals uh, from ATG VDL Group in Netherlands and uh, uh, APC Group uh, German for the production of package. Uh, hypermarket chain Lenta has informed me about their uh, intention uh, to buy 168 million package uh, annually, uh, biodegradable package annually. Uh, it should be noted that the market
It should be noted that the market of biodegradable packaging materials Excuse me. <coughs> it should be noted that the market of biodegradable packaging materials uh, unlimited uh, of the package. Uh, segments may be packaging for fast food uh, uh, and medicine, operation needs, uh, bandage, plasters, shoe covers, and uh, syringes. Uh, household goods, uh, poles, children toys, uh, which under the action a specific time in the water uh, will begin to decompose uh, to harness byproducts. Yeah, my uh, biodegradable packaging films uh, is also uh, edible. Thank you for your attention and awaiting the question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, I hope this bag was tasty. And you give a part for a jury. They, they all want to eat something, they have only water. <laughs> now we have something to eat in the break. So uh, I want to introduce the next speaker. And the next speaker is Alexey Leuchin, the student of High School of Information Technologies and Informational System. Please, welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, do we need emotions? Sure. We need for surviving. A bright flash, a loud sound, and we are in attention now. Uh, also, it's need, it need for training with a reward. Do it, and we'll get a candy. And I'm not talking about complex social emotions. Our society is built on them. So let's, uh, let's ask a question. Do emotions need robots? And how this is possible? Um, this is the cube of Leuchheim. Eight basic emotions, three axes, three neuromodulators, which control our emotional states. The neurobiologists demonstrated the correlation between these neuromodulators, serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline, uh, with mammalian decision making. The possibility of a person to make quick decision is connected with the fact that information in our brain is uh, emotionally colored. So we often make decisions by one or another emotional state, impulse, but machines do not have this. So we created some bridge between computational processes and biological processes. We have simulated uh, 500,000 neurons on a few cluster of brain parts which is answering for emotional states. As you can see uh, on the top of graph, we scared the red brain. And if it had wheels, it would run away. Also, we simulated disgust. It means that the rat was uncomfortable with uh, this stimulus, then was scared, and then felt joy. Uh, we uh, combined all three axes into the cube and have recreated the full picture of a newborn red kid. Who, uh, who reacts on the stimulus in the same way. I believe that robots without emotions are just a piece of hardware, but if we teach them how to feel, how to empathize, they can replace humans in physically hard jobs. For example, nurses who care uh, about paralyzed uh, patients. And also we can use this technology to create a psycho passport to learn a human brain. I believe that emotional robots will be the full member of our society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that after 10, maybe less years, the robots will fear not only that they will be get in the garbage, but of something else. Okay. And the next speaker is Mikhailova Margarita, teaching assistant Institute of Economic Business and Finance, the breaking the wall of photographer's language. Please welcome. Today I have the honor to present the topic which we all are very much concerned about, and this topic is our language. The way it changes and develops, the way it keeps people's identity, and the way it may reveal secrets about the people speaking the language. Let us look at two English words, should and blast, the meanings of which are quite simple. How do you understand phrases, I shoot a lot at night, and you blast at your friends? 
Cambridge Dictionary defines shoot as to fire or kill a person, the second blast denotes to explode or destroy something. Both of them contain dramatic and negative senses, as the direct meaning gives the idea that somebody is killed or injured. But uh, these uh, examples are taken from Forum of Photographers. And do photographers speak about murder or destruction? No, they just gave another meaning to these words. Photographers use verb shoot in the meaning to take picture, and the verb blast denotes to take picture using a flashlight. If a person tries to grasp meaning out of the context, he will definitely fail. And how did it happen? That particular notion represents absolutely different thing correct. We try to get inside the mind of photographers and find out the cognitive mechanism, which correlates to different objects. Under the study, we exemplified more than 400 lessons from Russian and English languages of photographers. And uh, the research was conducted with the help of method of semantic analysis by Russian linguist Iosif Abramovich Terin. Every day, human brain creates variable mental connections between different objects, uh, phenomena, and elements. And due to these links, new meaning of word appears. And linguists call these connections association links. Looking back at those examples, we can say that the correlation link between meanings of words should is the similarity people shoot and photographers take picture. They stand, held the camera or again, aim at something or somebody and fire or take a picture. And the correlation link between meanings of word blast is the similarity of um, a bright impulse of fire when we expose something or a light when we use a camera with a flashlight. According to our research, photographers encode mental or internal coherence between notions rather than visual or external. 64% of exemplified lexemes of photographers are created due to changes which are based on semantic similarity. And 36% of exemplified lexemes are driven by similarity of shape, size, elements, position, which represents the visual association. We can say that language is living phenomena. A language is living phenomena because people are creators of new words and new objects. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. One question. We have uh, 20 seconds. If I want to take a picture with my iPhone, can I use this language? Yes, <laughs> of course. You can, uh, you can do, for example, a selfie, yes, when we uh, use a front camera, or just a picture, a shoot, and there are a lot of lexemes uh, which denote um, things which we use in our everyday life. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. Okay, I will uh, use uh, those language next time. Uh, it was a, a signal for a break, but we have to listen for uh, one participant more. <laughs> and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome here Alek Yesin, PhD in medicine, Clinical Linguistic Lab, Kazan Federal University. Please welcome. Good day, dear colleagues. Mm, I would like to introduce our lab. First of all, at present in Russia Federation, there is no single concept for the diagnosis and treatment of musculoskeletal pain, headache, and comorbid disorders in children and adolescents in accordance in different age groups in accordance to bilingual environment. Our project is aimed at the development of fundamental approaches in diagnosis and treatment of pain in adolescents in acceptance in accordance with the concept of translational medicine. It will help to develop the Russian language validated linguistic diagnostic batteries, which includes those adapted to the bilingual environment. Modern data on the prevalence of the musculoskeletal pain, MSP, headaches, and comorbid disorders were obtained by foreign authors. Uh, according to some uh, authors, MSP is found in 10 to 20 percent in children. The, uh, the average age of uh, MSP onset is 12 years and the peak of chronicity is 14 years. Long existent or recurrent uh, chronic pain leads to, to a permanent or episodic maladaptive disorders. Disruptive syndromes are extremely uh, populated in general medicine, especially in pediatrics. In Russia, the problem of uh, acute and chronic pain in adults is very acute. Uh, concerning the same problem in children, there is, uh, there is only one study conducting according to modern criteria well, conducting to modern criteria which are, uh, concerns only headache in children without st uh, studying musculoskeletal pain in general. Our research is based on multifactorial analysis and identification of correlation links. It involves the creation of better of tests to standardize verbal reports. Diagnosis of these 
Diseases is possible only on the basis of verbal reports of patients and parents. To standardize verbal reports in order to develop a unified approach to diagnosis of these diseases in Russia, it is necessary to create highly informative batteries of tests which are currently not available. To achieve this uh, goal, we solve the following problem. Epidemiological study in large industrial city, determination of the frequency and head of headache, MSP in population of children and adolescents, de uh, development of linguistic valid instrument for diagnosis of headache, MSP, anxiety, and central sensitization, determination of leading peripheral factor of headache and MSP, determination of frequency of comorbid disorders and central sensitization as a leading factor of chronization of MSP and headache in children. Development of algorithm for diagnosis of treating and preventing headache, acute and chronic muscular pain and also common with disorders in children and adolescents. Thank you. Okay, a a any questions from jurors? A short question. The one short question and we're going to the break. Arkady, oh Victor, Victor, please. Okay, yes, yes, you can ask. So, Poly Walls Lab is more or less an international uh, project. So, um, did you already come in contact with international uh, scientists to solve such? Yes, uh, the problem is in Russia, there is no uh, Russian questionnaires for diagnosis of pain in children and in adults. Now we talk with the uh, University of Rochester, uh, Melbourne University. They give us a questionnaire. We translate them into Russia, validate, and then uh, use it in our practice. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Victor, for the question. And uh, this is the end of the first part. And we make a sh short five minute break to check uh, our computers, our presentations, and we welcome you here again here in the five minutes. Thank you. The short break. At some point I was asking myself, what am I exactly doing here in front of all these brilliant people? We believe that using these endolysins we will change the paradigm of the way we fight bacteria. For the last two years, I have been working to design a catalyst. It's not a theory anymore. This is the real deal. Instead of superficially cutting just the stem of the weed, we're ripping out the whole root. The concept is fantastic. All their ideas have to be in these three minutes. It's just amazing to see 100 winners, because every talent that has performed today is a winner already. This is about young scientists. This is about our future in science. The real problem, ladies and gentlemen, is up here in our minds. How about recycling human hair into papers? The essence here is to use waste hair as the raw material for paper production. effects of the drugs on the bacteria, on the human immune cells, and the pathology in the same environment. Listening to young people presenting concrete, pragmatic solutions, how to create sustainable food, how to save energy, how to recycle, really gives me a boost for my own work. All people of the EUC have a smile in, in, in the face and, and I trust them. They will change the world. And I think each one of them is taking their expertise and truly trying to do something meaningful. An ecosystem of people who are like-minded. I think it's definitely about sharing and networking. The best day in my life. It's a shame that it's just for one or two days. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, we continue our following walls lab here in Kazan Federal University. Please clap your hands and support the speakers. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And I want to present the next speaker, Ruslan Lukin from Alexander Butlerov Institute of Chemistry here in Kazan Federal University, the breaking the wall of carbon dioxide to fuel conversion. Please. So, good afternoon to everyone. And my research is about breaking the wall of conversion of carbon dioxide to fuel. So, every one of you knows such word called global warming, yes? And in late 70s, in the past century, scientists from NASA proved that average temperature on our planet increases with the accumulating level of carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is <coughs> greenhouse gases which is produced from our cars, from our power plants, and from our factories. So everywhere where we convert our fossil fuel to energy. So uh, we have to prevent this. And we can prevent this by only one way, is to convert carbon dioxide to something useful, for example, fuel. Uh, in another way, it's called recycling. And one of the possible ways is to make methane. Methane is a high-density dense, energy carrier, uh, which is widely used in our everyday life. So my research is about making a way to convert carbon dioxide to methane in a room temperature at very mild conditions without any energy loss. And uh, to make this reaction possible, it's a chemical reaction. We need catalyst. Keeping it simple, catalyst is compound which breaks the wall between our starting compounds and uh, our products. And uh, in collaboration with uh, our uh, colleagues from Italy, it's from Florence, ICCOM, we developed a new catalyst for conversion of carbon dioxide to methane at room temperature at uh, ambient pressures. And we proved that uh, this compound uh, makes possible to convert carbon dioxide to useful methane with about 100% selectivity and uh, high yields and uh, very rapid reaction. And uh, we proved that this reaction takes place, that we really get uh, methane, which is fuel, by gas chromatography and enamel. So methane, which we uh, made, can be easily used, for example, in cars. Every one of you know that uh, every engine in cars, burning engine, can also work on uh, methane. So nowadays, uh, we uh, made this reaction possible in small tubes. But we are still working to increase the scale of this reaction. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rita. We have uh, 30 seconds. So any question from the jury, from the chemical division? Yes, Mikhail, please. Yes, and uh, how easy to produce these catalysts because we will use them in large scale? Is it easy or it's not yet? Oh, so catalyst is compound which is added about uh, 100 parts per million. It's a very small amount and also this catalyst can be easily recycled. So used for three or four times. This catalyst, uh, we don't need uh, big amounts of catalyst. And also this catalyst is recyclable and can be synthesized using nickel salts. So nickel salt, they are really available. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ruslan. Thank you, Mikhail, for the question. Uh, and we are continuing our <coughs> chemical division <laughs> of our presenters. So it's glad to me to present the next speaker, Yulia Zaripova, uh, student of Alexander Butlerov Institute of Chemistry, breaking the wall of uncontrolled drug delivery. Please welcome. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today I'm trying to break the wall of uncontrolled drug delivery. Modern medicine is faced the fact that efficiency of drug delivery is very low. Look, we have a theoretically effective medicine at the entrance, but after entering the body, we often can't control the place and time of release of the active substance, because it's affected by many factors such as temperature or pH. A lot of scientists all over the world are working in this direction. But the problem remains topical. How can we manage drug delivery to make it more effective? Let me suggest a promising solution. Water the drug shell would give the active substance only at a certain body temperature. The hydrogel based on poly and isopropyl acrylamide can become such a shell. It is a thermoresponsive polymer 
and uh, when uh, heated in water above 32, 34 degrees, uh, that is close to the human body temperature, um, it undergoes a reversible phase transition from a swollen hydrated state to a shrunken dehydrated state and um, expels its liquid contents. Also, it is intoxic. In our work, we studied uh, the influence of additives of biologically active substances to the shrunking temperature of the gel. Using such additives as um, dopamine, ibuprofen, um, methyl salicylate and um, other uh, medicines, uh, we found that, the con that changing the concentration of active substance uh, can regulate the temperature of its release. Just imagine, you feel like getting ill, take medicine, and if you have a fever, it will work. But if your immunity manages itself, you won't get an extra portion of drug. Uh, so, um, let me show how does it work. Please turn on the video. I remove the gel from the solution, heat it up, and it shrinks, releasing uh, the dissolved active substance. Then, um, I uh, put it back into the solution, it cools down and returns uh, to its original state. The process is absolutely reversible. So, uh, the idea we proposed may help to solve the problem of targeted drug delivery in the near future. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Yuna. So we have around 30 seconds. So any question uh, to our speaker, please? Maybe Arkady? Okay, okay. So there's no question. Thank you very much, Yula. Thank you. And our next speaker is Dr. Emil Bulatov, the leader of chemical biology group here at Kazan Federal University, the breaking of the wall of drug discovery. Dear ladies and gentlemen, millions of people around the world die every year, including kids, simply because they do not have access to affordable quality medication. The reason is very simple. The costs of drug discovery and development have reached the historical highs, and the number of new drugs approved every year is decreasing. The good old ways of doing drug discovery are failing to deliver on our expectations. For every disease, there is a reason at the molecular level that, that is often caused by blocked or impaired protein functions. Restoring protein functionality using a small molecule drug can open a way to treat the disease like the locked door can be opened by the key. There is a disease-related protein and there is a drug. There is a lock and there is a key. By developing new drugs, we look for the keys that will break the wall and unlock the door. So, by collecting large amounts of data and learning deeper about the disease causing malfunctions, the locks become increasingly sophisticated and really hard to open. Creating the key gets enormously difficult and the common approaches will no longer work. Developing a new drug is like carving a statue from marble and creating the true masterpiece requires new tools that were not available to us in the past the artificial intelligence and neural networks. At the moment, we work on a number of targets that regulate protein degradation in human body, the ubiquitin proteasome system, also known as the molecular kiss of death. We take the advantage of small molecules that were initially designed to fight cancer and use them to develop new drugs for mostly untreatable autoimmune disorders like multiple sclerosis. At the moment, we already use most of the classical biological methods, but to achieve even more, we have to take, we have to use what the modern computational methods have to offer to us. We currently began work on using the artificial intelligence and developing self-learning algorithms that are capable of designing better drugs, much cheaper and much faster because we want new drugs to save lives by being available to everyone on this planet. Thank you. Thank you very much. What's about time? We have 20 seconds. One short question for the speaker. Well, 
please wear your shirt and using the microphone because we're recording. No, I think it's bad. Um, isn't this? In, isn't there a low problem connected with uh, like putting new drugs like to production and to use of something? Isn't this a big bigger problem that just discovered using computers and so on? This is one of the problems, but it's not the main one. The main one is that we have reached the limits of our scientific knowledge that allows us to get better drugs that will treat the diseases that are untreatable at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emil. And our next speaker is Maxim Pudovkin, the postgraduate student, Institute of Physics, Kazan Federal University, the breaking walls of simultaneous diagnostics and treatment and where's our clicker here you are so three two one start Good afternoon. light is a very unique substance it can inform for example here uh -huh. for example here uh, color gives information about temperature light can act it can heat it can cool it can even press but imagine that light could inform us about such diseases as cancer and then treat it, performing diagnostics and treatment. But it seems to be possible, at least because cancer does not shine. And the problem is, and the problem is that we cannot use this tremendous power of light in order to struggle against disease. But imagine that in a human body we have very smart agents called nanoparticles, which can find the cancer cell, grab it and start to shine, pointing their location. But this agent should have a shining core, which can fluorescence, and shell containing some molecules called antibodies, which can grab only cancer cells and ignore healthy ones. But this job is already done and we need something new, yes? Because imagine that in a human body we have a very smart agent which have already found the problem and he is probably waiting the next order and we can order solve the problem kill the cancer okay and how can he kill it heat he can cook the cancer if the temperature is only 42 degrees and no more and we must control the temperature because it can be dangerous so this new agent should have a core converting light into heat. Then shell, but shining shell. But the color of the light should strongly depend on temperature, so we could control the temperature. And then the same shell collecting antibodies. And now this agent can say, we have reached 42 degrees and it's enough, let's maintain it. And here, light, really, inform and act differently diagnose and treat and now using special nanoparticles and here in Kazan Federal University we are creating non-toxic multifunctional smart nanomaterials in order to use this tremendous power of light against diseases thank you very much for your attention thank you Maxim so we have 20 seconds again one short question Better if jury ask. Okay, Ma Mikhail, please. Question, how we kill cancer, your nanoparticles? Uh, by heating. They absorb light. For example, there is a small mm, gold nanoparticle, nanorod, and it uh, starts to heat the cancer. And uh, the shell around uh, controls the temperature. So because uh, if we exceed 42 degrees, it can be dangerous for surrounding healthy tissues. And now, yes, by heat. But this is uh, only one way to okay. kill it. Thank you. Thank you, Maxim. Thank you, Mikhail, for the question. Uh, I should clean the stage <laughs> for our speaker. And the next speaker is uh, Lilia Safina, the student of Institute of Computing Math and IT, Kazan Federal University, and she wants to break in walls of all methods to forecast electrical load. Lilia, please. Good afternoon. Uh, today, uh, the world is trying to survive uh, in uh, 
I'm sorry. Uh, Today, the world is trying to survive economic crisis, and a lot of companies are uh, looking for new ways to uh, save their uh, resources. That's why the problem we consider is very actual. Um, I'm sorry. Um, we have to know how much electricity population will use to generate electricity. Uh, energy suppliers uh, should predict this value with minimal error for short period. Unused electricity is um, economic classes for energy companies, so electricity becomes more expensive. Um, and a large part of electricity is generated by non-renewable resources, so uh, unused electricity is uh, irrational using of uh, natural source. Um, is it possible to predict this value with minimal error? What factors do influence? Um, we found answers uh, to solve this problem. I use machine learning. Um, it is an array of artificial intelligence where we train a computer uh, to, to solve uh, the problem with help now data. Um, and uh, there are different algorithms and methods of machine learning. Um, input data uh, for our methods is the data of uh, valor and time. Uh, and um, for example, um, when it is hot, we use uh, we use refrigerators and air conditioners more often, and uh, in the afternoon we use electricity uh, more uh, more electricity one at night. Uh, we got good results. Uh, the error uh, less one five percent is a good result for regression problem. Um, and uh, we can improve these uh, results if we add more real data. Uh, and uh, our program can be used uh, by energy companies. Thank you for attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lida. Well, I think that this girl has a great future. And I am aware that someday the companies from the Silicon Valley uh, we'll invite you to walk there. Thank you very much, Lydia. <laughs> and now I want to uh, invite uh, here on stage our guest from the Astrakhan city. It was a great surprise that we get an application so far, far away. Uh, so it's Natalia Khazova, and she wants to break in the wall of using food additives from extreme plants. And I want to ask, who uses salt for food? Um, yes, I know, this is a strange question. Everyone consumes salt. Ah. Mm -hmm. uh, we eat uh, more than uh, 10 grams of salt per day. Um, and uh, this uh, exceeds the norm by two times because we add it to our um, home food and we get it uh, from semi-finished products and fast food. And this situation um, can lead to serious health problems um, ranging from obesity to heart attack. So, how did you make it that you um, remove salt, but uh, the food does not become unflavored. <laughs> uh, our team uh, is um, engaging in studying um, the properties of extreme plants. Extreme plants are plants uh, that um, uh, survive in difficult climatic conditions. You all probably heard about the stevia 
organic sugar substitute. So, we have found a plant that um, can become organic salt substitute by analogy with the stevia. Uh, this plant um, um, contains uh, many um, biologically, biologically <laughs> active uh, substances uh, that um, have a positive uh, effect on the body. It fights against hyperlipidemia, has antioxidant, anti-diabetic, and immunomodulating properties. Uh, and um, a small amount is enough to make the food uh, salty. For example, uh, in these chips, uh, there is only potato, oil, and uh, organic salt substitute. Uh, you can taste it. <laughs> it's tasty and healthy. Uh, so, uh, thanks to our organic salt substitute, people can significantly uh, reduce salt intake and um, can become healthier. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Natalia, uh, can we uh, give some food to our jury? They are very hungry. <laughs> they, they are sitting here for a few, uh, for an hour. So, please. Clap your hands, support our uh, <laughs> presenter, please. Uh, and while our jury is trying these pretty good chips, <laughs> I want to welcome here uh, our friend, uh, postgraduate student, Institute of Fundamental Medicine and Biology, Emmanuel Kabwe. Emmanuel, please. He wants to break the wall of mechanism of Pumala hunter virus. Breaking the wall of infectious diseases. Uh, most of the time when I stand on the rostrum like this, uh, people think I'm breaking the wall of Africa, talking about African problems and what is going on. But I want to assure you today that in the next three minutes, I'll be breaking the wall of something else. I'll be breaking the wall of Infectious, infectious diseases. Now, if you look at the screen, most of these diseases, 50 years ago, they were not talked about. But just suddenly, boom, they exploded. People started dying. Thousands of people in Africa died from Ebola. Now, this is exactly the reason why we should break the wall of infectious diseases. Now, I'm sorry. Now, what wall are we breaking? How are we breaking the home? We are monitoring POV virus in the Republic of Tatarstan in all the endemic areas of Tatarstan, from infectious diseases, from infect infectious persons and rodents, using uh, genetical methods to come up with uh, this kind of structure. Poo virus has uh, eight genetic lineage which is secreting in them uh, worldwide. So in the Republic of Tatarstan, through monitoring, we discovered that in the re limited territory, there are two kind of um, poor virus lineage which is secreting, both of which, which has different kind of um, clinical manifestation. Now you can imagine if a person is infected with two kind of genetical manifestation, um, virus, what will be the result? So we came up with uh, this kind of structure to help um, doctors to do a quick or a rapid um, diagnostic. And also the structure is so helpful in the development of medicine and vaccination. But if you just look at the structure, you know what to prescribe to a person. 
So we co recommended this kind of structure to them, uh, to the doctors. Breaking the hole in infectious diseases, we believe that if we are able to monitor infectious diseases in this way, so any kind of disease which can come up, we, we are able to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. And uh, this is our last speaker, Anastasia Tikhonova, a student of Institute of Fundamental Medicine and Biology, and she wants to break in the wall of Alzheimer disease treatment. Welcome. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, we all want to have a long and prosperous life. However, not all of us are given such an opportunities. We have one of several diseases, but neurodegenerative diseases are still striking. Some of them are really tricky, just like Alzheimer. We don't know the real molecular mechanism under it, and we still don't have the right treatment who can stop the disease completely. And it's getting younger. There are patients in their 30s and 40s, and it's really horrifying. But we came to solution. We have a blink of light, trophic factors, like nerve jaw factor, that promotes the appearance of new neurons and involved in regulation of survival of it. But this is a little problem here, because it's generally too big, and it cannot enter through the encephalic barrier. But we have a special plan with a secret agent, a virus. Viruses are usually seen as the bad guys of biology, but here they help us. We genetically modify them to produce NGF, and we put them in a mononuclear cells. This is the case where the young blood helps the old. So they extract the placenta, put the virus promoting NGF here, and inject it to the mice. And our cells, umbilical cord stem cells, produce some factors that are beneficial to angiogenine, vascular endothelial growth factor, hepatocyte growth factor, epidermal gro growth factor, and so on. But what is special is NGF that will help to appear, to appear with the new brain cells that is really helpful in the case of Alzheimer's disease, that brain tissue is lost. Our studies are preclinical, and we transplant the cells to mice, and we measure their behavioral activity, and we show a real improvement on their memory in behavioral tests. And we measure some proliferational markers, like the nestine and double cartine, that show us that new neurons appear, and it helps the brain to gain new nerve cells. And that is how our construction works. And we hope that it will give a great potential and can be used in a medical research and a medical usage. And I hope all of you will have a decent and great life full of great memories that can not be taken from Alzheimer. Thank you all. Thank you very much. We have uh, 25 seconds for a question, please. The last speaker and the last question. Ayrat? No, <laughs> because he, he, he knows well. <laughs> okay. Okay, no question. Thank you very much. Nice to thank you. Well, uh, when I met uh, Anastasia the first time and I looking for her presentation and her work, the first in the Russian language, I was so overwhelmed because I realized how many talented young girls, boys, academics we have here in Kazan Federal University. And today I think we all get it, get this fact that we are all very, very talented. Thank you very much. That was the all speakers, but we have one, one the big question, who is going to participate in the Falling Walls, not LAB, but the Falling Walls conference in Berlin. So the jury is going to the secret garden, the secret room, and there they will make some magic and give us an answer who is going to participate in Berlin conference. So we have a break for a jury, Zulfia, please, carry out the member of jury. No pressure, everything is democratic. 
<laughs> we have a president of the jury from the Germany, so everything would be clear and fair. Okay, so we have a 5-10 minutes break and then we know who will be the participant in Berlin. Thank you. At some point I was asking myself, what am I exactly doing here in front of all these brilliant people? We believe that using these endolysins we will change the paradigm of the way we fight bacteria. For the last two years, I have been working to design a catalyst. It's not a theory anymore, this is the real deal. Instead of superficially cutting just the stem of the weed, we're ripping out the whole root. The concept is fantastic. All their ideas have to be in these three minutes. It's just amazing to see 100 winners because every talent that has performed today is a winner already. This is about young scientists. This is about our future in science. The real problem, ladies and gentlemen, is up here in our minds. How about recycling human hair into papers? The essence here is to use waste hair as the raw material for paper production. effects of the drugs on the bacteria, on the human immune cells, and the pathology in the same environment. Listening to young people presenting concrete, pragmatic solutions, how to create sustainable food, how to save energy, how to recycle, really gives me a boost for my own work. All people you see have a smile in, in, in the face and, and I trust them, they will change the world. And I think each one of them is taking their expertise and truly trying to do something meaningful. An ecosystem of people who are like-minded. I think it's definitely about sharing a network. Yeah. The best day in my life. It's a shame that it's just for one or two days. One, two, three. Ladies and gentlemen, as it was said by one of our ministers, let me speak from my heart. <laughs> uh, on behalf of the jury members, we are uh, li we like to say thank you for everybody of the participants because uh, it was really great to hear your reports to hear your short lectures, to hear your argumentation. I think that every report was worth of some uh, worth of something. But uh, on behalf of the jury members, uh, I and my colleagues will uh, give you the certif certificates of participation. Everybody will get a certificate of participation. So come here. I'll. Uh, I will call in by name and uh, family name. You will be getting the certificate and uh, staying here on the scene. Okay? Uh, in some uh, in some strange manner, not in alphabet, not uh, in everything. Do not uh, try to find any system in these certificates. So the certificate of participation. Uh, uh, Marcel Haliulin. Emil Bulatov. Maxim Podovkin.
Иван Захаров. Эльмир Нугманов. The first lady in the list of certificates. Лилия Сафина. Руслан Лукин. Маргарита Михайлова. Алсу Гараева. Алексей Леухин. Эммануэл Кабве. Анастасия Тихонова. Юлия Зарипова. Наталья Хазова. And finally, Олег Есин. Smiles. Okay. Uh, okay, please stay on the stage, and I want uh, our vice rector, Professor Danis Nurgaliev, say a few words, and then we will uh, announce the first runner-up, second runner-up, and the winner. Thank you very much. That's very nice presentation or spectacles yeah something like this because you know uh, I say who is scientist yeah uh, maybe a scientist is guy who could explain in two three minutes to everybody on the street what is his complicated science and explain and this guy should understand understands everything yeah this is very important because if you uh, if you uh, make science and you could very long explain very complicated words and form some Ex mm, some edu mm, many many mm, complicated words not under not understandable for simple people yeah but it's very important to could explain in one minute for everyone on the street what is your science and they, this guy should say oh wow this is very important yeah thank you very much for such nice presentations yeah thank you thank you professor Ngaliev and uh, the President of the jury, Victor Reimer from Aachen University, will announce the second runner-up and the first runner-up winners. And then uh, Professor Nurgaliev will announce the winner. So say a few words and then the winners. Yo, um, hello together. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. I really uh, like this uh, kind of uh, project. So um, today one of you will go to Berlin. Will um, not today, but just in a few, uh, few months you will be now able to go to Berlin. But before, uh, before we uh, start to give you your prizes, uh, just a few words from my side. So uh, it's a um, really good international project that uh, brings us together. So it's called even the Breaking Walls. It's a really nice uh, name for that. So Breaking Walls, when we see right now the uh, situation in the world, and we now here break the walls using science. So this makes me a lot of pleasure. 
And now uh, we will give... So the diploma and the, uh, the third place, please. So maybe Mikhail will, al will announce yeah. the Michel third will place and will give the gift. Okay, for me it's a great pleasure to say who breaks the walls of cancer, observation and killing. Maxim Pudovkin is the third place. And here I have the second place, and the second place goes to Aliulin Marcel. <laughs> and please, Professor Nogalif. Okay, and finally, who breaks uh, a real wall on the road to Berlin? Okay, this is, yeah, I have these tickets. Mulatov <laughs> Emil is the winner of the first falling walls left here in Kazan. Mulatov Emil is going to Berlin and will present Russian Federation, Kazan Federal University, there in the final conference. So, good luck there. Please stay for the photos. Zulfia, I think we should go there and make a photo with the winners. Yes. <laughs> and the jury, please, e e everyone, please come here and join us uh, for the final photo. The winner is going on the first stage. You sure? Arkady, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much all who come here and spend this magnificent evening with us. We're glad to hear uh, to see you here again. Thank you.